The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians, Chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good will of his pleasure, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, and making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Paul's letter to the Ephesians is a rarity amongst his epistles, and that is that instead of challenging people to, be, to repent of sins they're committing so soon after they were members of the church, or trying to correct um, splits and different groups within different or parts of the church, uh, trying to correct false doctrines that people are introducing, or foibles, or silly things that they're doing. None of those things seem to be the case here in his letter to the Ephesians. Rather, what he has is, seems to have is a group of people who are trying very hard to live the gospel the best they know how, being very faithful, and that uh, his letter to them is a spiritual letter designed to do one principal thing, and that is to enhance their spirituality and help them be more, uh, more spiritually minded. Not that they're not already, but to enhance their experience. You need to, uh, if I haven't said it already, I should tell you about Ephesus. Ephesus was the third biggest city in the entire Roman Empire. Rome was the biggest. Then Alexandria, the capital of Egypt, was the next biggest, and then came Ephesus. Ephesus had a population of about a quarter of a million people. And Ephesus had a chief claim to fame, besides this fairly large population, was it was the home, uh, it was the place of the Temple of Artemis. Artemis was the world recognized then uh, goddess of fertility. And this temple was a huge thing. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world. There were seven wonders of the ancient world. And there was a man who wrote a book, and I can't remember his name right now. And he talked about having seen the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, having seen all of the, uh, all the other seven wonders, including the 
pyramids. But when he saw the temple of Artemis, all the rest faded to insignificance. This temple was 450 feet long, 225 feet wide, and had um, tower, not towers, what am I talking about? Had uh, pillars that were 60 feet tall. This was an amazing structure. It was 120 years being built. It was absolutely phenomenal. Paul had been there earlier and they were going to kill him because uh, the silversmiths there were selling small replicas of this for people to take home. And because Paul was baptizing so many people in the area, the number of silver replicas of the temple was falling and these people weren't making as much money. And so the silversmiths wanted to kill Paul. And they had a theater there which had 25,000 people it filled and they were very angry and upset. A lot of people really didn't know what they were there for, but they wanted to support the town and whatever else they were doing. And so Paul's letter to these people has some incredibly interesting things in it that you do not find. Now you've got to remember who Paul is. Paul is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ called by the Savior himself to serve in vision. And so when Paul says something, when Paul teaches something, it has significance. And you want to understand why does, you know, I mean, take a look at what he says and see if your church has that teaching, that philosophy, you understand that. And if you don't, why don't you? Aren't the things that he teaches important for you to understand and know and teach and have in your church? I'll give you an idea here. We're talking about some of the things that he says and verse 4, according as he hath chosen us, so this is this God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in the world. Now get this, we've talked about this from as far back as Abraham, of being chosen before the foundation of the world. How do you choose somebody who isn't born yet before the foundation of the world? Paul understood that concept. The Ephesians understood that concept. Abraham, who was told by the Lord, I knew before thou wast formed in the belly, I knew thee. Okay? So these things occur. Do you understand where these principles come from? Do you understand what they are significant for in your life? In verse 5 and verse 11, he talks about predestinated. Does that mean forced to become whether you want to or not? No. What predestinated means? Having the opportunity to fulfill a role or a calling. Having the option of doing it. You don't get sit down and say, okay, uh, you now have a choice. No, the point is, the opportunity will come your way. What are you going to make of the opportunity? Verse 10, we, we don't hear too many times, it talks about dispensations. But here it talks about, this is Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. The dispensation of the fullness of times, which is where we are now. These are the winding up scenes. Do you understand what a dispensation is? Wouldn't you like to know? Might it have an effect on you? And talks in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. When you're baptized by somebody who has the authority to baptize, not just thinks it's a good idea, Paul ran across people who'd been baptized by somebody other than John, who thought, oh, I was baptized unto John's baptism. Didn't say by John. And they didn't even know about the gift of the Holy Ghost. If, you, if you're baptized with somebody who doesn't have authority, if you're baptized by somebody who doesn't have the authority to give you the gift of the Holy Ghost, uh, are you really baptized? Okay, Verse 20, which, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So there's the Savior at the right hand of God for now and for all eternity. And verse 23, which, which is his body, the church of Christ is, the members of the Church of Christ are, are like, uh, symbolically, the members of Christ's body. And then I would love to spend half a day, at least, on the next few words. If it's important to you, if you think you'd like to know, write me an email and we'll discuss it. This f last phrase in this first verse, first chapter, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. This is an amazing thing to understand.